afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another Motivational Monday as part of our educational webinar series. My name is Josh Clark, and I am have the pleasure and honor of being the chair-elect for the International Dyslexia Association. And when not uh, in that role, I also have the, the pleasure of being the head of school of the Skate School, which is an independent school in Atlanta, Georgia, serving students with dyslexia. And I am so excited and honored to get to be a part of today's conversation, Resilience in Challenging Times, part one, parents and teachers. So today, uh, Dr. Brooks, who I will formally introduce in just a moment, is going to describe and illustrate realistic, realistic strategies to develop, develop a resilient outlook and lifestyle in ourselves, and in doing so, become better equipped to do the same for our children. And I think it's really uh, important to, to remember, and it's exciting to know, that this is part one of, of Dr. Brooks's uh, conversation. There is going to be a part two on August 10th. And so today, Dr. Brooks is going to focus on how we as adults, as educators, as caregivers, how we can rebuild resilience in ourselves uh, and therefore uh, be better equipped to help our students and our children. And that will be the topic of his next webinar on uh, August 10th. In addition, we also have coming up another webinar, Integrating Leading Supports with e Educational Technology. So please be uh, sure to, for both of those opportunities, uh, uh, make sure you uh, check out our Facebook page, email blasts, all those things so you can stay up to date. Speaking of, we need subscribers. So if you're watching us today uh, on YouTube or on Facebook and you haven't hit that subscribe button, please do, because we really want to bring, um, uh, develop and expand our subscribers so that we can get you more content, keep you updated uh, and all those things. I also very briefly, um, before I formally introduce Dr. Brooks, I also want to remind everyone or maybe introduce you to the COVID relief fund that the International Dyslexia Association started. As we all know, so many students uh, as, as the, the toll of COVID uh, took over our country, did not have access to connectivity, to laptops, to the other kind of essential devices that they need uh, in order to continue to learn. So the International Dyslexia Association has put together a fund so that we can get computers, laptops, software, connectivity, um, even tutoring assistance and stipends for advocates so our, our, our dyslexic learners can continue to uh, receive the support that they need uh, during this, this difficult time that I think we all know is, is probably gonna continue into the fall. So uh, supporting that is so important. We have already rewarded $30,000 worth of scholarships, computer softwares, and so on and so forth. So we're asking everyone who can to please contribute. Uh, even a dollar contribution is going to make a difference, again, for all these students across the country who we all know, uh, especially during this time, uh, uh, need our support and need access to quality education that is, is built for them uh, and that uh, is helpful to them. So with that, I am going to introduce today's speaker. I have to tell you before I, I, I do this, um, uh, uh, when we pushed out the information about doc Dr. Brooks talking today, three different people emailed me and said, you've got to watch this. This is Dr. Brooks. And so it was really funny because obviously I didn't know that I, I was going to be a part of it. So that was exciting. So I am uh, thrilled on so many levels. Um, I'm going to read through Dr. Brooks's uh, 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 full biography, which I know he doesn't care if I do, but I'm going to. And I know you're all going to bear with me as a dyslexic man reads out loud. So I appreciate you in advance as if I make any stumbles. But Dr. Robert Brooks is a clinical psychologist on, uh, and part-time faculty member of Harvard Medical School and former director of the Department of Psychology at McLean Hospital, a private psychiatric hospital. His first pos position at McLean, which Dr. Brooks, you can correct if I'm pronouncing that wrong in just a moment, was as principal of the school in the locked door unit of the child and adolescent program. He has lectured nationally and internationally and written extensively about such things as psychotherapy, motivation, resilience, parenting and family relationships and a positive school and work environment. He is author or co-author of 18 books, including Raising Resilient Children, The Power of Resilience, Achieving Balance, Confidence and Personal Strength in Your Life, and Handbook of Resilience in Children. Dr. Brooks has received many awards for his work, including Hall of Fame awards from both the Connecticut Association of Children with Learning Disabilities and CHAD. Most recently, he was given the Mental Health Humanitarian Award from William James College for his contributions as a clinician, educator, and author. So with that, I'm sure you join me in my excitement uh, and anticipation, and I will turn things over to Dr. Brooks. Thank you so much, uh, Josh. I'm just gonna now share the screen. And uh, 
so I could put my PowerPoint up. I hope everyone can uh, see that. I'm going to move this up. Well, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction, uh, uh, Josh. I'm delighted to be able to share these ideas about resilience. Uh, Boy, that's quite a long title, but basically today we're gonna to look at, as Josh had mentioned, what we could do as parents and teachers and other caregivers to help ourselves be resilient. Before I leave this first slide, uh, just to let people know that my website address is there. The reason I especially mention this is that I write a monthly article for parents, teachers, mental health professionals, and everything I'm gonna be discussing today you can find briefer articles on my website. And especially the last four since March have related directly to what I'm gonna be speaking about today. So there's a lot of, uh, there's certainly a lot of, uh, I'm just looking to advance this. I don't know why I'm having trouble here. Sorry about this folks. Oh, here it is. Uh, I, uh, if, so if there are any articles anyway, uh, or anything that you're interested, the articles are there. Sorry about that, all of a sudden I lost the arrow. So I wanna just talk briefly, and I say very briefly about what I mean by uh, resilience. Because when I was co-editing one of the books that Josh mentioned, the Handbook of Resilience in Children, I discovered that people have very different really definitions of resilience. So without overly simplifying things, uh, let me tell you the definition I'm gonna to use today. As you can see, it's the capacity to cope effectively with adversity. A big word there is cope. I've often said that resilient people, both children and adults, see problems as things to be solved rather than overwhelmed by. See, if our mindset is that a problem comes up and we can try to figure out how to solve it, then it's easier to be resilient. If our first thought is, I don't even know where to start, which all of us have faced at times, then of course, it's much more difficult to be resilient, to bounce back from adversity because you just feel so stuck and you don't know how to proceed. In all the research that has been done about the topic of resilience, I want to share with you one of the most important findings. Years ago, when psychologists got more and more interested in, in resilience, they interviewed adults who had really grown up under very adverse situations. Adults who grew up in war zones, adults who grew up in homes, unfortunately, there was physical or emotional abuse. Many of you know that a lot of my interest in resilience really started when I worked with you know, many kids and many adults who had learning or attentional problems. So they interviewed these adults and said, we could have never predicted based on how you were growing up, the experiences you had growing up, we could have never predicted that you would be as resilient as you are today, as optimistic in good relationships, good jobs. What do you think was one of the most important things in your childhood or adolescence to help you be resilient today? In every study that was ever done, and I certainly can't you know, go over all of them, but I'll summarize it. In every study that was ever done, one of the first answers always was there, at least, there was at least one person along the way who truly believed in me and stood by me. Even one person could make a world of difference in how that child was going to handle life challenges. One of my heroes in the field of psychology, and you can see on the PowerPoint, Julius Siegel, he was a psychologist in the Washington DC area who died about probably now about 10, 11 years ago. He called that adult a charismatic adult in a child's life. Now, some people aren't crazy about the word charismatic, but everyone loves the definition. He said a charismatic adult is an adult from whom a child or adolescent gathers strength because some people have this notion why they don't like the term charismatic. They think of this almost overwhelming person, but it could be almost anyone, someone from whom you gather strength. So when I started to really use that term and always of course giving credit to Dr. Siegel, there are a couple of questions that were raised at my presentations. One was interestingly enough, do we as adults need charismatic adults in our lives? And I've sometimes kidded and said, unless we've decided you know, to be hermits, we all need them. 
As a matter of fact, as you're listening to me, think about who are the charismatic adults in your life as adults? Ask this question, who would say I'm a charismatic adult in their life? Who gathers strength from me? These are important questions uh, certainly to think about. So at all times, whether as kids or adults, we need people who are supportive. And as we'll hear, we also have to serve as charismatic adults for others if we're truly to be resilient. Second question, which I often get, it may seem like a simple answer, but I get this a lot. Can we help others, including family members, including children, including students to be resilient if we don't feel very resilient, resilient ourselves? And here too, the quick answer is if we're feeling stressed out, if we feel we don't know where to, uh, how to solve problems, if, if then it's gonna be much more difficult to help children our students be resilient. And we're gonna look at that today. So in this webinar, as you know, Josh mentioned, I'm gonna discuss strategies for nurturing our own resilience so that we can be better equipped to help our children so that we can serve as charismatic adults in their lives. <clears throat> in the next webinar on August 10th, as Josh also mentioned, I'll describe how some of these same strategies actually can be used to help our children deal with stress and become more resilient. It's not like we have to invent different strategies at different times of our lives. There are some general principles that apply throughout our lives. So let's look at this. Let's take this journey. I'm basically sharing with you almost a 40 year journey uh, I've had as a psychologist, a teacher, a father, a grandfather in trying to understand when we educate and raise kids in today's world, what are some of the most important things we could think about in terms of helping them to be resilient? So one of the concepts I've used for years now is of a resilient mindset. Many years ago when I got interested in the question, why is it that some children basically are more resilient than others, and we know the support they have, I then asked the question, how does a resilient child or adult see the world differently from one who's not? I felt the more I could identify characteristics of a resilient person, of a resilient, the mindset they had, a resilient mindset, then I could really, in my therapy work, help people to be more resilient, or I could suggest things to parents that will help them, or to suggest things to adults that will help them to be more resilient. Probably the first thing I always mention in terms of a resilient mindset has to do with this focus on what I call personal control. Some people have said it's almost like the serenity prayer, but basically as I look back at all the, it, both children and adults I've seen in therapy, as I think about my own life, I realized one of the things that helps people to be resilient is to expend our time and energy on situations over which we have influence rather than in situations that are beyond our control. There is so much unhappiness I've seen in people when they're trying to change things they have no control over. And I started in my books and writings to use the phrase, I said, let's remember that we can strive to become the authors of our own lives. When I would see adult patients, I would actually say to them, think of your life as a script and think of the way you would want to change the script and what you could do, not what someone else could do. And so I use this metaphor, authors of our own lives. It's not often easy to be an author of our own life, but we're gonna look at some of the things you can do. But always try to focus on what is it that I really have control over, even if it seems like 85% of what's going on in the world, I have very little say about, which is true for most of us. And I just to emphasize that point, during the past few months, we have experienced and continue to experience two events, all of you are very aware of, that have fueled intense levels of anxiety and uncertainty and made it increasingly challenging to maintain a sense of personal control. First were the major disruptions in our lives caused by COVID-19, disruptions that were unprecedented. And then on May 25th, as we were struggling with all of the ramifications of COVID-19, 
another unsettling situation occurred. And all of you know what the next slide is gonna be. The murder of George Floyd, an event vividly captured on camera and transmitted across the globe. It was to serve as a catalyst for worldwide protests against racism and police brutality. And what I say is for many people then, the long simmering emotions unleashed, unleashed by the murder of George Floyd, coupled with the distress and disruptions caused by the coronavirus, intensified a sense of helplessness and hopelessness in many people. Many of you may have seen recent studies that show since COVID-19 appeared, the levels of anxiety and depression in both children and adults are on the rise as are mental health problems. So we know it's had quite an impact on our lives. And I, I just wanna emphasize this next point. It is especially at times of such uncertainty that one must strive to develop an attitude of personal control. And I say it's a difficult task, but I believe there are steps we can initiate to become more resilient. And I'm gonna say even small steps we can initiate so while things may seem overwhelming, I still feel there are things we can do so that we don't become paralyzed and really have no solutions to things. So what I want to report is what are some of those things? I hope every one of you, as I go over this list and as you think about personal control, first of all, ask yourself, am I following this list? Am I doing some of these things? And if not, what is it I can do? And the other thing I hope you really conclude is that these things are within our control to do. I would never put up something that many viewers would say, I can't do this. So just think about it. What are you doing now? What are the small, and I'm gonna emphasize small changes you could start to make to really realize a much more resilient mindset. And we have to remember mindsets, our attitude towards things lead to our lifestyle. And we want to be more resilient in our lifestyle. So I hope all of the things I mentioned don't seem like they're off in the stars somewhere, but they're right here on earth and things we can look at and things we can really reinforce. As I talk about personal control, I also think one of the most vital, vital things in being resilient is the nature of our relationships. This goes to the notion of really Siegel's charismatic adult. Connections with others serve as a source of strength and reinforce the feeling we are not alone. One of the things here that has come up a lot is, which I also want to emphasize, is social distancing does not mean social isolation. We'll see there are still a number of ways to stay in touch with others. But let me get back to the notion of connections. Think about who you turn to. Think about your connections. Where do you gather strength? And the reason I put that about social distancing, since there has been social distancing, the number of people who've said, uh, and continue to say they feel very lonely. And we have to make sure if we know some of those people that we check in on them. Loneliness is a devastating thing. Even before COVID-19, there's an article on my website. I don't know how they did this research, but it was that loneliness was the equivalent of, of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. I'm, again, I'm not sure how you do that research but it's so devastating when you're feeling lonely. It affects your immune system. It affects you know, how your physical and emotional health. As a matter of fact, it was, I think a couple of years ago that the prime minister of England at that point, Theresa May, actually appointed a minister of loneliness. She said, we have to understand loneliness. We have to understand the impact, but as importantly, we have to look at what is it we can do. So I think we should think about who are those people who may feel lonely, who can we reach out to, who through our places of worship we can reach out to in, you know, in terms of different resources in that regard. But there are other ways. And just to give you a few, these are more personal. This really interested me. The Brooks family, which we're all very close, is scattered, I think, in seven states from Maine to California. 
And I don't know, it was about eight weeks ago, one of the members of the Brooks family said, why don't we have a virtual reunion? You're just seeing part of the screen. I, I think there are about, you know, 35 people, some with two or three to the same screen. It has been so popular that we have now had four of them. And now it's like every two weeks. And we just catch up on things and laugh about things. And one of my nephews is a physician on the front line in Los Angeles. And he was sharing with us some of his experiences. So it doesn't have to be a whole family like this, but think about who you can connect with. Also, as many of you probably have relatives, on the uh, right up here is my granddaughter, Maya. She's uh, graduated from uh, Scarborough High School in Maine. And of course it was not the usual graduation, but different close family members were there when she tried on her cap and gown. So at least we could feel we were part of this. And here she is, you know, they drove up, they went up, got their diploma and went down wearing a, you know, a face mask with S for, for Scarborough. So I think I bring this up that if you don't use Zoom or whatever, you know, you do, think about how do you keep connected? Next time I wanna talk about with kids, how do we help them to feel more connected? Another main area, as we look at resilient lifestyles, is the following. A number of years ago, I read an article written by a psychologist who said we should practice or implement TLCs. Many of us think of TLCs, tender, love, and care. Maybe it is, but it's basically in that article, therapeutic lifestyle changes. It had to do with tender, loving care towards ourselves. This psychologist, and this was well before, as I said, the pandemic, this psychologist basically said, there are things within our control. It's not that it's easy, but there are things within our control that we can implement that will help us to be healthier, both emotionally and physically. And so I listed some of them, I added some things. None of this is easy. I keep saying that uh, if, if change were easy, I would see each of my patients, especially the adult patients for one session and say, now go make a change. It's very difficult to make lifestyle changes, especially when you're, when you're stressed. So let's look at some obvious ones. As I put this down there, just reflect upon, is this something I could add to my daily practices if they're not there now. Uh, if they are there, great. A structured day. This was maybe even more so, of course, when there was school, remote learning going on in, in schools, but it's now even, you know, a lot of kids where the plan was for them to go to, you know, a day camp or an overnight camp are not gonna do this. This should not be done in a rigid way. But you know, having worked with a, a number of uh, kids with learning and attentional problems, having some structure is important. Some limits to how much screen time, some limits you, you know, to different activities. Again, we have to be flexible, but just having some structure in the day helps us a certain time to eat and really helps the ki our kids exercise. Probably you're going to say, oh, if one more psychologist mentions exercise, I'm going to go crazy. There is so much wonderful research that shows that even 20 minutes of exercise a day can be so helpful. A friend of mine and colleague, psychiatrist John Rady, a number of years ago, wrote a book called Spark, where in that book, there was research to show that when kids came into school in the morning, if they did aerobic exercise, they were better able to learn. So I'm not talking about planning, you know, for the Olympics or uh, at all, but just even walking, if you can, doing a little exercise. I know, and this was part of the structured day, I have found it very useful. This works for me. It's not gonna work for everyone. I get up, wash up, and one of the first things I do is I exercise. And then I eat breakfast, and then I really feel much more energized. So look at that, the walks you take with your kid, make sure your kids, I'll talk about this, get some exercise. And please just try to build it in. One of the sad things I've seen with a number of my patients over the year, one of the first things that goes when they're feeling more anxious or depressed is exercise and that should stay there. Okay, I'm sure most of you have heard the next one. 
a healthy diet. Again, I'm not being rigid about this. Very honestly, one of the reasons I exercise is so I could have some chocolate chip cookies, which I love. But we know here also there's research to show that there are some foods which are healthier than others in terms of our emotional well-being, whether it's a, you know a vegetables or fruit. So just look at that. This psychologist, when he talked about TLCs, he said these are things we can slowly change in terms of our everyday practices. An adequate amount of sleep, of course, it's easy enough to say we should get an adequate amount of sleep, but if you're anxious and depressed, it's, it, it's gonna be much more difficult. However, here too, you can Google strategies for getting an adequate amount of sleep. We know there are some things you should not be doing. You should not be watching the screen right before you fall asleep. Maybe some people, you know, it can work for, but I will tell you that for many others, it cannot. So there are certain exercises we could do. And the last one, and each of these, we could spend a lot of time on meditation and mindfulness. I find exercise in the morning and in the afternoon, just spending 10 minutes on meditation. And if you saw me meditate, it's like when I, it's probably similar to when I've gone into schools and seen five and six year olds. I just basically take deep breaths in and out. I find it's 10 minutes and it's very helpful to me. There are so, so many apps now where you, you can learn about meditation. And it, it doesn't mean that you're meditating all day, but you may find 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. Please remember, start small. Think about this as lifestyle changes. Think about this. This will help me to be a charismatic adult in the life of my children, my students, and where I'm a caregiver for kids. This next one point is something I think I've been writing a lot about, actually for years. I say to engage in contributory activities or charitable activities on a regular basis to enrich the lives of others. And in the process, we are enriching our own lives as well. Let me tell you how this first started, where I began to emphasize this. A number of years ago, I say that when you've been in the field for over 40 years, I, I was writing one of my first books on school climate. And as I was writing the book, I was wondering what do people really remember as the significant events in their school experiences? And so I gave out a questionnaire, it was filled out anonymously to 1500 people. And then after even the book was written, I gave it out to more. And I'm just gonna go over the first question and why it's very vital for me. The first question was of all the experiences you had at school, what was one of the best experiences you ever had? And I wanted to see what the impact of an adult, something a teacher, a school administrator, someone else, an adult at the school said or did that boosted your motivation, your sense of dignity, your self-esteem. The Probably one of the most common, if not the most frequent response I got, I had never expected. And now I wonder why I hadn't expected. <clears throat> the number one response was, when I was asked to help out, I got responses like, I remember when a teacher asked me to pass out the milk and straws. I remember when a teacher asked me to tutor a younger child. I remember saying, this is one of the most positive memories of school. And it's not just in school. Actually throughout our lives, there's now research to show that when we are making a positive difference in the life of someone else, it actually lessens our own stress and builds up our resilience. Probably next time I will mention that when I go into schools about kids I'm seeing in therapy, kids who have struggled in schools, one of the questions I ask right away is, what is one thing this child or adolescent does at school in which he or she feels they are making a contribution to the rest of the school, where they are enriching the lives of the rest of the school. We know that when people feel they're making a difference into our senior years, it leads people to lead, lead longer lives. It leads people to feel a sense of purpose, which is one of the most important things in resilience. 
every child, every adult should feel they are making a difference in the life of someone else. And as a parent or teacher, you have many, many opportunities for that. And there are different ways we could do it. As I say, there are many ways to engage in activities that reinforce a sense of purpose. Volunteer work, you know what has really impressed me as we look at responses to COVID-19 is the number of children and adults who are helping others. Children who have through the website or just the ingenuity in other ways have actually raised money for volunteers, for people who are less fortunate they, than they are. It's just wonderful to see. And in the process of helping others, they are also helping themselves. And then peacefully protesting for a cause in which you believe, which has become even more powerful uh, since the murder of George Floyd. My wife and I went to a vigil which was put together and sponsored by the clergy in our town. And, it was, and what really impressed me was as people lined the streets, and I was very impressed, first of all, everyone was wearing a mask and social distancing. How many parents brought their younger children who are holding up signs? And what also impressed me a lot were the number of kids who look like middle to high school age kids who would come in groups of four or five and to really, you know, be really joining that the vigil. Very powerful statement. And my own kids, grandkids here, and I wanna just mention this, that's Teddy on uh, the left and Lila on the right. I hope the screen's not uh, maybe reversed how you're seeing it. And why I bring this up is uh, they actually went to Black Lives Matter uh, rally in Boston, in the inner city, where after my postdoctoral fellowship, which was at the University of Colorado Medical Center, I worked in the very place where they started the rally. Why well, I thought this was important, Teddy, ha has uh, had an IP. He, uh, he had uh, speech delays. Thank heavens for, by the way, early intervention because he has come along in such a nice way. He's just finished his freshman year in high school. But what really amazed me was in seeing his passion and what he wanted to do. And then what really, really impressed me was at this rally of and my daughter-in-law said there are at least a couple hundred people. Teddy said he'd like to give a talk. And here he is giving a brief speech about why Black Lives Matter is so important to him. You know, as I looked at it, I said, it's like 10 years of therapy. A few years ago, it would have been very difficult, difficult for him. But now, with he went up there and he just said a few words in a very passionate way. And when the audience applauded, his whole face lit up. So think about, especially for next time, what do you do? How are you a charitable family? And what is it that you can engage yourself in, your kids in, that will add a sense of purpose that you actually say to them, you're being you know, very helpful. That will ease some of the stress and anxiety and the research shows will actually help people to be more resilient. It's a purpose in life. To another key issue is to recognize the impact of gratitude. There was research done. If I had been involved in this research, I would have said, I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference. It shows even with someone like myself, a psychologist, sometimes you cannot predict what's going to happen. It was done actually focusing on seniors who basically felt their life was meaningless now, that they didn't contribute in any way, that you know their good years were past. And what psychologists started to look at is what would happen if every night, every other night, every third night, people sat down and simply wrote out two or three things for which they are grateful. It's not to deny what all the problems you may feel, but can you start changing your mindset to focus, what am I grateful about? Interestingly, and now there's much more research about this as well. If you could think about, and as I say, many people will write about two or three things for which you're grateful. 
it actually helps to ease your anxiety and depression because what it's doing is it's shifting your whole mindset from everything is terrible, I don't know what to do, whatever, to focusing on some things for which you are grateful. So one of the things we've looked at is just consider things for which we are grateful. I know some families have contacted me every night or every other night at dinner time. They will talk about what are a few things we are grateful for. Sometimes it's the same thing as the night before, or sometimes it's different. Sometimes we encourage kids to think what they're grateful for. So for someone who thought, not that it's really a gimmick to have people write it down, I now appreciate the power of considering what you're grateful for. The next part of gratefulness is to communicate messages of gratitude to others. Think about a charismatic adult in your life. Think about someone who may even, hopefully they're still here, may have been a charismatic adult when you were growing up. Think about what a brief message of gratitude to them might mean. It's always interesting to me when I've, I've given a talk or you know nowadays a webinar, and someone will write to me and say something like, I'm, you've probably heard this before and then offer me a compliment. And I'll always write back and say, but I hadn't, I haven't heard it, hadn't heard it from you. So thank you so much. It means so much to me. Select one person. It could be your own kid, what you're grateful for. And just ask, what are some of the things that I'm grateful for and who can I communicate to, to help them to understand what an impact they had on my life. And again, some research I've done where I've collected some of these notes that people have sent to others. And I have a number from my own life. Not only does it help the person who receives it, because now they feel they've made a difference, but anyone who sends such a note says to me, it helped me. And then the very last point is, is uh, this before we take questions that to appreciate the power of humor. Uh, a, a month or so ago, I was invited to give a talk uh, for what was called the Global uh, Stress Summit. And there were some real experts, I would say, on the power of humor. And what they basically said is humor really connects us with other people. It can provide a sense of well-being. Humor should not be sarcasm. And in, in, in no way should it put down other people. But it's a very powerful prescription for helping us to feel better. I don't know about any of the listeners. I got more cartoons related to COVID-19 that were humorous and not, you know, one could say, was it distasteful in any way? No, it just gave you a, a smile. I remember my son, Rich, uh, who lives in the Portland, Maine area. I showed you his uh, daughter getting her graduation uh, diploma. Uh, he sent one when toilet paper was uh, really lacking in stores. And some of you may have seen it. It was a Brinks truck with two guards. And what were they taking off the truck, out of the truck? Not money, but toilet paper. And I think it's just a way of lightening one's humor. Uh, I mean, lightening one's life through the use of humor. So I'll just show you a brief video clip. Some of you may have seen this. This went around where we were really having to quarantine and now some places have to quarantine again, but it really led to a laugh. It was shown <coughs> during this global stress summit. And then I will uh, take uh, questions uh, with Josh's help. So let me, if I can get there. Because of coronavirus, you are going to be quarantined, but you have a choice. Do you A, quarantine with your wife and child, or B? B. 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 So simple, but it captured what some of us, you know, certainly were feeling. Uh, so I hope some of these ideas will be very helpful just to think about, even to select one thing to work on, maybe, you know, be more involved with contributory activities, writing a note of gratitude, thinking about what you're grateful for, what are your relationships like. So I'm now going to get out of this. Uh oh, what happened here? Can you see me, Josh? 
Yes, I can. I think if you if you can click stop sharing screen, and all we see right now, all we see is your Zoom um, browser, which is yes. just fine. No, okay, I, I got it. <laughs> it, it, it. There you go. I'm trying you to be resilient. All of a sudden, <laughs> stop sharing it seemed to disappear, and that's why. Okay, oh. can you so you can see and hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, and thank you. That was that was phenomenal, and that that idea of a charismatic adult. I. That really resonates. I, I would imagine that almost everyone on this call right now, that is our, our goal, right? Uh, either for our own child, for students in our classrooms, you know, for uh, tutors. And that's really what we're all trying to be. Um, and one thing that, that struck me about that definition that you shared, I, I love that idea that it's an adult that people can gather strength from versus give strength to. It's not, it, 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 it was, it, it, because one of the things that really kind of kept coming to me during your, your conversation that I, I think is right, but I, I, I want to make sure is kind of this permission that by investing in ourselves, we're allowing people to then gather strength from us. Is, is, is that? Yes. You know, what's, right? it's, it's what you said. It's basically for me a two way street, especially if we're thinking about uh, uh, adults that I love his image, Siegel's image of a source, you know, of strength in the life of, you know, another he said of a children, but I say in everyone. How I view it is, as we're growing up, we need those sources of strength. You know, that's how we develop uh, that emotionally and in so many different ways. Then I, how I view it is, not only do we continue to need people who are sources of strength, but as I mentioned, in terms of contributory or charitable activities, based on the research I did, Josh, we also can start serving in that way. So for me, as especially because we're focusing on adults, one should look at the following. As, and it was questions I raised. Who would say I'm a charismatic adult in their lives? Hopefully, you know, the kids, the kids. Who are charismatic adults in my life? Who do I turn towards? And so it's a real give and take. In, in the beginning, as kids are developing, they need those charismatic adults. But what I would love to see is if we as parents and teachers and other caregivers really model being a charismatic adult to kids are there for them or empathic or understanding, offer them encouragement, that that modeling will lead them, even as teenagers, to be able to be a charismatic person for others. So I, I hope I've explained it. It's for me a very powerful kind of image uh, that, uh, you know, Siegel talked about. And by the way, as an educator, uh, just to let you know, in, in one of his articles, he said, in a surprising number of cases, the charismatic adult in a child's life turns out to be a teacher. I mean, we hope they have many charismatic adults, you know, in their lives, but some kids who unfortunately have grown up in homes where there's not any encouragement, there could be abuse. One teacher can make the world of difference. In my longer web, you know, uh, webinars, well, actually I should say presentations, I have some wonderful stories of how one teacher redirected a kid's life forever. But as yeah. parents, hopefully we serve in that way. And, and do you think, especially for teachers, do you even think teachers are always conscious that they played that role or that it's just an overt act or do you think it's just that, who they are? That is such a wonderful question because again, in my presentations, I have a slide. I mean, it wasn't here today because different presentation. Often we don't even know when we've been a charismatic adult in a teacher's life. I've had, and I'm sure you could relate to this uh, any of the teachers. I've had teachers who have said to me, I got this letter from a student from 25 years ago who remembered one comment and I don't even remember saying it. And that's the other point I, I make. There's a wonderful concept about what they call micro moments and micro affirmations, how one comment you make to a person or Unfortunately, the negative is microaggressions. One comment you make may be remembered for the rest of their lives. So sometimes teachers do not know. I have some very funny uh, letters I've gotten from teachers. They've sent forwarded, you know, to me letters they got, uh, comments that they received <laughs> that they really said, "I don't even remember saying this. I don't remember doing this." But it makes us aware of how important uh, it is. So. A long-winded way of saying, sometimes we don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, so it's so far, I still remember seventh grade, Miss Pierce wrote in my yearbook, 
something about, you know, come see me in 20 years because I can't wait to see where you end up. And for all I know, she wrote that in every single person's yearbook. <laughs> but I still to this day remember thinking, I can't mess this up because in 20 years, Miss Pierce is going to want to see me. Right. And it's at any age. When I was a postdoctoral fellow, I had just gotten my PhD and what, and I made my first presentation. This was at the University of Colorado Medical Center. In my mailbox that afternoon, it was a little folded up note. I actually write about this. I call it the five second note written by my super, one of my supervisors who said, you did a great job today, Bob. Just a little, I got to tell you, Josh, I took that note, folded it up. And there wasn't much to fold. It was so small. I put it in my wallet and I kept it that whole train, training year. It was wow. like, it was my security blanket. Those little things can make a world of difference. <laughs> and actually in the next webinar, I wanna, I'm gonna want to talk about what are those little things a teacher could say remotely that can be of help? Mm -hmm. What can yeah. parents say to teachers that can be of help? How do we support each other? Again, social distancing does not have to mean, as I said, social isolation. Yeah, and, and, and it's been interesting too, as, as a parent living in this world right now, you know, I've been uh, with my children 24 seven, right? And so I've just become so much more conscious of my choices and their awareness around my choices. And do, do you think as, as adults, because I think we have to give ourselves permission so often to exercise, to, to do things that aren't overtly for our kids, just by making those choices and modeling those things, do you think that then sets them up to in life make those same choices so that they can have the capacity to then be a charismatic adult? Yeah, another wonderful question, Josh. I, I think kids have to see us modeling the behaviors we would like them to see. You know, if we tell kids to exercise and we're not, then it's very difficult. If we tell kids not to say bad things about other people, and I have examples of this, but they hear us saying bad things, bad meaning, you know, put downs or whatever, then it's much more difficult. So what your question touches on is the following. I have a whole series of exercises for teachers and parents where I will say, write down all the words you hope your children or students will use to describe you. Mm -hmm. And the next question is, <clears throat> what do you intentionally, and I use the word intentionally a lot, what do you intentionally say or do so they're likely to use the words you hope they use? And then the third question is, what words do you think they would actually use? By that point, yeah, exactly. no one invites me back. But <laughs> what you brought up is, and one, or any one listener could say, okay, let's stay with parents. What words do I hope my kids use to describe me? I've even now with COVID-19 said, when COVID-19 lessons, whatever that even means, what, what words do you hope your kids will use to describe their experience and what, during COVID-19? And what words do you think they would use to describe your behavior during COVID-19? it gets us to think about how are kids are forming images of us. So if I say exercise or meditate, first of all, sometimes you can involve your kids in certain things, whether it's just going for a walk, let's get out, let's go for a walk. So you can involve them. Or you could, you know, especially young kids, one could just say, I'm gonna exercise. I need about, you know, 15 minutes of exercise right now. Also problem solving, as I said, you know, resilient people see problems as things to be solved rather than overwhelmed by. So if kids see us presented with these different difficulties saying, okay, what are a couple things we might do? What could we do? I, you could even say it out loud, especially with younger kids, you're modeling problem solving. What might be one of the things we could try? I think it's great when parents also model that something may not work, but what they say is, I wonder, if it doesn't work, what can we try next? So what they're doing is they're taking away, you know, the sting of not, not something not working, but saying there's good, could be another solution we can learn from this. So there are so many ways we model, we involve the kids, you know, in these different activities. And the, another thing which your question uh, prompted is, uh, kids also, just like kids need time to be alone, I think they, there has to be a time that they understand parents need time to be alone. Uh, if it's a two, you know, parent house, that pe we all need time to be, uh, to be alone. Uh, and there we're going, uh, my, uh, my grandson, Teddy, whose picture I showed, he was funny. He's been keeping sort of a diary and I'm laughing about this. He said, one of the things is he's lost time to be alone. <laughs> you know, this was right <laughs> yeah. after he started. His mother was home. 
who she's a school psychologist. His father was home. And all of a sudden, this was a kid who sometimes liked to be by himself, you know, kind of thing. So once things settled in, he I could, you know, he had time to be alone. Because I think some parents at first felt we got to be involved. We got to help our kids this way. But sometimes we all need time to be alone. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you find just in the kind of your broader observations, uh, certainly in during this time, but in general, are there are there traits, choices, kind of trends culturally that we make that might be popular but are kind of in, in, uh, kind of go against the idea of resiliency, right? I mean, are there, are there things that culture encourages us to do that actually is going to harm ourselves and then our, therefore our ability to help our kids? I, well, there can be. You see, even in, especially in this time, there are a number of parents, and especially I'll say even especially if your child has had struggles, you know, emotionally or with learning, sometimes it's very easy to just want to jump in and help them because, you know, they've had structured time in school now, they don't or whatever. So I think one thing is that you don't want to throw a child in 10 feet of water if they can't swim, but you really have to slowly help them to be able to get their toes wet. The reason I mention it in this way, uh, I, over, I guess over the years, I've started to believe children are more resilient than I appreciated probably at the beginning of my career. That's why I look at strengths much more. I'll talk about this next time. I call them islands of competence, that every child has beauty and strengths and islands of competence. So in, in terms of your question, I think we have to be careful. It's what happened with the quote, self-esteem movement. You know, I used to write about self-esteem and some people misinterpret it to mean rush in and rescue your kid. Every kid gets a, an award and that's not what it really you know, meant. So I think we have to be careful that we still have to hold kids accountable, that we still have to discipline kids, uh, but we have to remember discipline is a teaching process that we, we really have to make sure that kids meet certain responsibilities uh, and that we have to realize that some kids during this time, maybe even more so are gonna fall down at times, but we have to, that gets back to another question. We have to model problem solving and mistakes, not just go in and rescue them, but say, let's think about what we can do differently next time. What are some of the steps we can take? So I think where we have to be careful sometimes in, in this day and age is that we don't, I think, rush in too quickly uh, to help kids, that we still realize this can be a period of growth for them. You know, when my granddaughter Maya, she talked about all the senior events that has any senior this year, we're, we're losing out on. I, I wrote to her and I said, you know, and I was very empathic. I said, you know, how painful this is. But I said, I will guess that there will be experiences coming up now. And I said this on purpose. I said, and in this no ways to minimize the sadness you're feeling now, but there'll be experiences which will help your life to be more full. And then I, you know, uh, I, I said to her almost with an emoji, you know, smile saying, and think about the stories you're gonna be able to tell your own children or grandchildren about 2020 and all that uh, it went on. So you wanna empathize if they're going through a painful time, but you also want to let them know there can be growth from this. And, you know, if a kid is feeling down, Certainly empathize with them, validate what they're feeling, but think about, can they be helpful to others? As a family, could we do charitable work? So you're still helping to foster growth and resilience in them. Yeah, that's a very helpful perspective. And it also makes me think as somebody who uh, has dyslexic children myself, as somebody who spends you know, my career working with dyslexic children, that, that tendency to kind of want to protect versus kind of galvanize, right? And that's so important for us. When you, 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 this is hard and you got to figure it out, but mm -hmm. we can give you tools that make it a little bit easier, but we can't excuse you from, yeah. you know, the, the, the challenge. I'm glad you used the word excuse because I think a diagnosis should uh, uh, help us to understand the child and how to help them, but should never be used as an excuse per se. And what I mean by that is uh, child, ha well, I was thinking, you know, a boy years ago who had ADHD, learning problems, Tourette's, and this may seem so far out, uh, but he always used that as an excuse and it didn't let him go forward. And so I 
basically said to him, I know this, you have this, 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 but let's look at what will help you to move forward. Because you don't want the kids to use it as an excuse. So to have a child with special needs during this period who may, you know, really needs more hands-on than maybe they're able to get certainly remotely, I think we can empathize with them and validate, we should, but we also have to look at, okay, what is going to help you to grow? What is gonna help you to change? Let's try to figure this out. I've been collecting, in part for the next webinar, a number of articles, and as a head of school, Josh, you can appreciate this, we don't know what the next year is gonna look like. I mean, here in Massachusetts, there was just, we gotta prepare for remote learning, we gotta prepare for you know in-house learning, we gotta prepare for the hybrid model. So we don't know, so we do have to prepare. That helps us to feel a sense of personal control, but we, we can't anticipate anything, everything that, I mean, that's gonna go on. But I think we could think about also without children. Once we have a clear, how do we prepare them? What is it that we can do? How do we foster, and I wanna talk about this next time, how, how does a teacher foster relationships with a kid remotely at first even? What are some of the things? And some of it, I really, I've, in interviewing some kids, what is helpful to them even with teachers they knew who then everything became remote? Uh, you know, on that. So, it, you know, I often feel like parenting and teaching in this day and age, I often say it's like you're walking on a tightrope. You don't want to lean too far one way or too far the other. And sometimes that tightrope feels like there's no safety net underneath there uh, on that. But there really is a safety net. If basically you've developed a positive relationship in your home, you know, even if afterwards we can say, we shouldn't have said this, we shouldn't have said that, if the overall climate in the home, just like I say to teachers, if your overall climate in the classroom is good, kids somehow will forgive us. And not, you know, uh, for that, uh, and, and I'm not talking about an egregious error we make, but uh, you know, sometimes we say we might've said things uh, certainly differently. Yeah, um, and, and kind of a few minutes we have left kind of as a, preview to what you just said that's coming uh, on August 10th for your, your next talk, because uh, I'm definitely going to be uh, tuning in, because that, that the relationship building online mm -hmm. with kids that are, you know, that's, that's one of the things that's definitely on uh, 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 my mind. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm thinking a lot about as a head of school is, you know, I feel like as adults, we also have to, let's say we return to school, it's going to look different. Mm -hmm. And do you agree that there's, there's a, we own some responsibility as adults to uh, process prior to what's it going to be like when kids are, if they're wearing masks, if we're six feet apart? Because I, I, I keep thinking the kids are going to look to us to determine how they, how they kind of power through this. Yes. <clears throat> and as a head of school, I'm sure that's very much on your mind. I, I really think that starting even now, we have to think about what is, what is going to look like to have a mask? How do you prepare kids? How do teachers, maybe even remotely, when they meet with their class the first time before anyone steps in school, how do they talk to the kids about this? See, the more kids know what's going to happen, especially younger kids, but even teenagers, the more they can anticipate what's going to happen, the less frightening it is, the less uncertainty and actually the greatest sense of personal control. So if we know we have to wear a mask in school, then it's less frightening to do that. Also, I don't know, schools could get very creative. Creative. I, I was looking at my granddaughter, Maya, that photo. She had that wonderful face mask with a big S, <laughs> not for Supergirl, yeah. but for Scarborough. So there are always, but see, teachers will feel more confident if they know what some of the procedures are. That's why, with yourself as the head of a school, you know, one has to think about, okay, what are the things we have to prepare for? Do the teachers feel, you know, that they are prepared? There's always going to be unexpected things that come up, but the have we discussed it as, as a staff? What do the kids know? You know, what are some of the things that the kids should be prepared for? I mean, we could, um, hopefully next time we could talk about some of these very specific things. Maybe there'll be much more knowledge we have about what it's going to look like, but one really has to prepare it at this point. And I think it can be done. It's not gonna be easy, but the more prepared one is for different options. Again, people see problems as things to be solved when they're resilient. The more prepared they are, the greater sense of personal control. Well, and I love, and, and, and I, I, I'm being told I need to wrap it up, but I love uh, uh, as I do that, that 
especially younger kids, when we give them information, they suddenly have personal control. And I think that's such an important point. And again, it kind of goes back to what you're saying. We're not excusing anybody. We can empower. And I think that's going to be so important. So Dr. Brooks, thank you so much. This was phenomenal. Josh, thank you so much. I can't wait for the, for the next one. And I know uh, IDA was collecting questions for this one. And uh, hopefully there'll be more next, uh, you know, next time we could focus on. But certainly we'll be focusing on some of the things we talked about. Well, good. Well, thank you again. And thank you to all everyone that was able to join us. As a reminder, um, uh, please can, uh, can, uh, consider contributing to that COVID-19 relief fund uh, that the International Dyslexia Association has put together so we can make sure that uh, uh, we, we help all students during this time. You can find more about that on the um, uh, there's a YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a description on there. You can also go to their Facebook page. There's a donate button on there for that. Again, thank you all so much. Uh, join us again on August 10th, uh, Dr. Brooks. Uh, will be with us. And the best way to know about that is make sure you hit those subscribe buttons on Facebook and YouTube so you can get that information. So again, Dr. Brooks, thank you so much. My pleasure. Pleasure to meet it's, you. Uh, you as well. It's been great. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.